hopefully the recording started. Okay, hi everyone. Uh, thanks for coming to another Grass and Trade seminar, the first one back for the new term. Uh, today we have our own Evelyn smith Roberge from University of Waterloo, uh, who's gonna be talking about uh, local choosability theorem for planar graphs. Go ahead, Evelyn. All right, thanks, Sheila. Uh, thanks everyone for coming. Um, so today I'm going to be talking about, again, this local choosability theorem for planar graphs. It's uh, my latest project with my supervisor, Luke Postal, so everything I'm talking about will be joint work with Luke. So we'll start where every coloring talk starts. Uh, so what is a graph coloring? So a coloring of a graph G is some function from the vertex set of G to a set C of colors, where we ask that for each edge in the graph, the vertices on each endpoint uh, of the edge get assigned to different colors. So we'll say that phi is a K coloring if the size of this color set is equal to K. And if G admits a K coloring, we'll say that it's K colorable. So probably the most famous theorem in the field of graph coloring is the four color theorem, uh, which is proved by Apple and Hawken in 76, uh, over a century after it was first conjectured. So the theorem says that every planar graph is four colorable. So if you have a graph that embeds in the plane in such a way that no two edges cross, um, then the size of this color set here, C, needs to be only four to ensure that the coloring exists. So a really natural question to ask then is if we rule out certain substructures in the class of planar graphs, uh, can we lower the chromatic number of the resulting class of graphs? Uh, and the answer to that is yes. And to get to what I mean, we'll need a definition. Um, so we'll define the girth of a graph as being the length of the shortest cycle in the graph. So here, for instance, this is a triangle free graph with a cycle of length four, so it has girth four. And then in 59, Birch proved that every planar graph of girth at least four is three colorable. So if you rule out triangles, then already you can shrink this, the size of this color set C by one. All right, so that's enough on uh, ordinary vertex coloring now. So for the rest of the talk, I'm going to be talking about list coloring. So list coloring is a generalization of ordinary coloring, where instead of having this kind of global color set C from which any vertex could choose its colors, uh, we instead assign to every vertex V its own personal list L of V of colors. So then when we're coloring, again, we want uh, the endpoints of every edge to receive different colors. And on top of that, there's the added restriction that we want each vertex to receive a color from its list. So we'll say that G is K-choosable if G admits some list coloring for every list assignment L, where the size of the vertices lists are at least K. Um, so here the idea again behind K-choosable is as long as you can guarantee that each vertex has at least K choices for colors, then there's a coloring. So you might wonder, given that the four color theorem holds, uh, is there a corresponding theorem for choosability, um, so for list coloring? And well, the answer is yes, but it's not, it's not exactly the same theorem. So in 93, uh, Margaret Voigt showed that there are planar graphs that are not four choosable by giving a construction actually of a, a planar graph that isn't four choosable. So the best that we could hope for then is that lists of size five might suffice. Um, and indeed, Thomason showed in 94 that every planar graph is five choosable. So then given that for ordinary vertex coloring, if we ruled out certain short cycles, we could bring down the, the chromatic number of the corresponding class of graphs. Uh, you might wonder if the same thing is true for list coloring. And of course, the answer is yes. So if we rule out triangles, um, we get planar graphs of girth at least four. And it's a really easy fact to show that planar graphs of girth at least four are four choosable. So lists of size only four suffice for a, a coloring. Um, unfortunately, that doesn't end up being very interesting because it follows really easily from the fact that uh, planar graphs of growth at least four are three degenerate. So every planar graph of growth at least four has a vertex of max degree three. And then by iteratively picking off these vertices of max degree three, you get an ordering of the vertices and you can just color greedily from the list of the vertices. You might say, all right, then what about showing that planar graphs of growth four, uh, at least four are three choosable? Can we do that? And the answer is no. So again, Voigt gave a a counterexample. So, gave a construction of a planar graph of girth four that is not three choosable. So, the next natural question is okay, what if we rule out four cycles as well? So, we've ruled out triangles, next natural thing, four cycles. And Thomason shows that, that that actually does it. So, in 95, he showed that every planar graph of girth at least five is three choosable. So, if you rule out triangles in four cycles, then you only need lists of size at least three. 
The main result I'll be talking about today is a theorem that uh, combines all three results in red on my slide. So both of Thomason's theorems about five choosability and three choosability um, with graphs of growth five and the easy fact about graphs, planar graphs of growth four. All right, so before, hang on, okay, yeah. So before I actually state our main theorem, we'll need a couple more definitions. Uh, so we define the growth of a graph and now we'll define the growth of a vertex. So let G be a graph and V be some arbitrary vertex in the graph. We'll define the girth of the vertex uh, as being the length of the shortest cycle in the graph that contains that vertex. So here, for instance, we've got this vertex U that's contained in a triangle, so he has girth three. V is not contained in a triangle, but is contained in a four cycle, so has girth four. And then the shortest cycle containing W is the five cycle, so W has girth five. Now we'll define a local growth list assignment. So if G is a planar graph and L is some list assignment for G, I'll say that L is a local growth list assignment if uh, all of the vertices that have growth three, so are contained in triangles, have lists of size at least five. All of the vertices that are not contained in triangles but are contained in four cycles have lists of size at least four. And all of the vertices with growth at least five have lists of size only three. We'll say that G is local growth choosable if G admits an L covering for every local growth list assignment L. Then the result is that every planar graph is local growth choosable. So before we go on, I'll mention that ours is, of course, uh, not the first result to, uh, to have to do with kind of uh, localizing the list sizes like this based on some structure uh, surrounding a single vertex or edge. Um, so in 97, Borodin, Kostichka, and Woodall showed uh, or proved a local version of Galvin's theorem um, for list edge coloring, where the, the list of edges depends on the maximum degree of the endpoints of that edge. Uh, in the same vein, in 2020, Banami, Zelkorteng, and Luke gave a local asymptotic version of Kahn's theorem, where again, the list size of an edge depended on the max degree of its endpoints. In 2020, Tom Kelly and Luke gave a local epsilon version of Reed's conjecture, where their uh, list sizes depended on a uh, linear combination of the vertex's degree and the maximum size of a clique in which that vertex is contained. And finally, or finally in this list anyway, uh, Davies, Dejuani, de Verclou, Kang, and Piro again in 2020 gave a theorem for list coloring triangle free planar graphs, uh, where vert vertices list sizes were bounded again by a function of their degree. So ours is not the first result to have these kind of local list assignments, but as far as we know, it's the first to have uh, local list assignments uh, where the size of the list depends on this local girth parameter rather than something like the degree. So again, our main theorem that every planar graph is local girth choosable simultaneously implies Thomson's theorem that every planar graph is five choosable, the easy fact that graphs of growth, planar graphs of growth at least four are four, four choosable, and Thomason's other theorem about the three choosability of planar graphs of growth at least five. I should say it now, whenever I talk about graphs uh, in this talk, they're always planar. So if I forget to say planar graph, I mean planar graph. Okay, so uh, before I kind of get into uh, how we proved our main theorem, I'm gonna talk a bit more about Thomason's five choosability theorem. So, uh, the theorem, I mean, it's it's really lovely. I'll actually go through the proof a little bit later, um, but Thomason didn't prove directly that every planar graph was five choosable. He instead proved a stronger, more technical theorem um, that implied the choosability result that we actually care about up here. So the theorem he proved is the following. So we let G be a near triangulation. Um, so that's a plane graph where uh, all faces except perhaps the outer face are triangles uh, with outer cycles C, V1 up to VQ. We'll assume that vertices V1 and V2 are colored one and two respectively, that everything uh, on the outer cycle has a list of size at least three, except for V1 and V2, and that everything else in the graph has a list of size at least five. So this is just a more restrictive list assignment than a five list assignment. And the claim is that the coloring of V1 and V2 extends to an L coloring of G. Okay, so I'm gonna go through the whole proof. Uh, I'm sure most of you have seen it before, but I know for a fact that some of you haven't, and I couldn't pass up the opportunity uh, of getting to be the person to tell you about it because it's just one of my favorite proofs. Um, the, the proof is by induction on the size of the vertex set. So you can do kind of your base cases with one, two, three vertices. Uh, so from now on, we'll assume we've got at least a handful more. 
Um, so first we'll need a claim. The claim is that the outer cycle here is cordless. So to prove that, we'll say suppose not. So suppose there is a cord, uh, so an edge not in the outer cycle where both endpoints are in the outer cycle. It's like the, the pink one I've drawn. The idea is the cord divides the graph into two graphs, G1 and G2, whose intersection is the cord and its endpoints. Um, and of course, both G1 and G2 uh, have strictly fewer vertices than all of G. So we'll color uh, G1 by induction here. So extend the coloring of V1, V2 to a coloring of all of G1. And then we'll do the same thing for G2. So here again in G2, now we have two adjacent pre-colored vertices in the outer cycle. We didn't touch the list of anything else. Um, so this satisfies the hypothesis of the theorem. And so we can color G2 again by induction. We hear this teal vertex is now playing the role of V1 in the theorem statement. So that tells us the outer cycle is cordless. So then the way the actual, the proof goes, having established that claim, uh, we'll look at uh, G here um, and consider the, the next vertex after V2 here in the outer cycle. So we've got V1, V2 who are pre-colored, and then this next vertex V3, who since he's on the outer cycle, he's got a list of size three. Um, and all of his neighbors, uh, well, all of his neighbors here that aren't V2 or V4, let's say, um, are not in the outer cycle by our cordless claim. So in particular, they're, since they're not in the outer cycle, they have at least five colors in their lists, just by how we define the list assignment. So what we're going to do is we're going to look at the list of V3 and select two colors that are not the color that V2 has. So in our case, that's pink and teal. And we're going to remove pink and teal from the lists of all internal vertices here. Now, since they started with list of size five, they still have lists of size at least three. And so we can delete V3 and what remains here is gonna still satisfy the hypotheses of our theorem. And so we can color it by induction. So now these all have colors. Um, by construction, all of the internal vertices here don't receive pink or teal as their colors here. However, this vertex down here might receive one of pink or teal, but even if it does, it's fine because there's the other color in the set pink teal available for V3. And so we can color V3 and we're done. And uh, yeah, that's that's the whole proof of the five choosability theorem. Um, and I think, I don't know, it's just it's just such a cute proof. It's such a cool proof. Uh, it's so cool that the theorem that is analogous to the four color theorem for choosability can be proved like this. Um, if you haven't seen Thomason's paper on it, I highly recommend you go read it because it's only, uh, oh, if you cut out the white space, um, the whole paper sits on a page, I think, and the proof of the theorem is 14 lines, which is really remarkable because the conjecture was open for 19 years, I think, before he proved it. Um, so it was it, that planar graphs are five choosable was initially conjectured in the two papers by Avish Rubin and Taylor and then by Vizing, where they introduced the concept of list coloring in the first place. So anyway, part of the reason I think it took so long to prove this theorem was because people were kind of I guess trying to prove the, the five choosability theorem directly instead of the stronger, more technical statement that Thomson came up with. So if you, if I tell you, you know, to prove that every planar graph is five choosable, um, that's kind of like it's a it's a smooth mountain of a problem because um, there's there's no like footholds and no obvious ways to get started. Coming up with the theorem statement itself is pretty easy, but when it comes to proving it, uh, it just kind of seems impossible. So when Thomson came around and uh, you know, suggested this, this stronger, more technical theorem with more restricted list sizes, um, then it's not so much proving the theorem that is difficult. It's more coming up with precisely the right thing to prove that's difficult and takes time. So our key takeaways and some ideas that we're going to carry forward into our proof uh, are the following. So vertices in the outer cycle of the graph were allowed to have fewer colors than the list assignment we actually cared about. And it's precisely that that allows the induction to go through. Uh, next thing, the pre-colored path couldn't be very long. So this, this isn't going to, uh, the second idea is not one that's going to be true for our theorem, but we still need to consider what happens as you increase the length of the pre-colored path. So it's still an important lesson to learn. Um, yeah, and so you know, we, we saw from Thomason's uh, five choosability theorem that if you color two adjacent vertices in the outer cycle, that's always fine and always works. But as soon as you color a uh, path of length two like this on the outer cycle, then already you can start coming up with counter examples where say you've got something like this, a vertex with a list of size three that's adjacent to three pre-colored things. So obviously that coloring wouldn't extend. 
Similarly, Thomason didn't directly prove that every planar graph of growth at least five is three choosable. He instead proved a stronger, more technical theorem that implies that result. So I'll state his result for three choosability. Um, so it says if G is a planar graph of growth at least five with outer phase boundary walk C, and S is a path of length at most three uh, in C, then we'll let A be some subset of C that is an independent set. And then we'll define a list assignment L like this. So everything in S has a list of size one. We think of these vertices as being pre-colored. Everything in A has a list of size two. And everything else in the graph has a list of size at least three. So then the claim is that every L coloring of S extends to an L coloring of G, unless perhaps A contains a vertex that's adjacent to two pre-colored things. So like I've drawn here. Now, if you're familiar with uh, Thomason's papers, um, so he's got two different versions of the theorem, uh, and none of them are quite what I've written down here. Um, but in, in his paper, A Shortlist Color Proof of Grotius Theorem, uh, he mentions in kind of the closing remarks that Matt DeVos pointed out in a private communication that maybe the theorem goes through a little bit more smoothly if you phrase it kind of this way. So this is the way that we've gone with. But in Thomason's actual more technical theorem, um, he doesn't have a kind of exceptional case here that comes up. And that's because he requires, uh, in addition that the, to being an independent set, that these vertices A not be adjacent to anything that's pre-colored. But anyway, this is the version that we'll be working with uh, for today. And it's essentially equivalent. Okay, so back to our theorem. So the idea, we're gonna follow the basic framework as both these Thompson theorems and try to come up with a stronger, more technical theorem that will imply the choosability theorem that we actually care about so that every planar graph is local growth choosable. So again, our technical theorem is also going to involve uh, pre-coloring some path or cycle in the outer phase boundary of the graph and extending that pre-coloring to a coloring of the whole graph. Of course, we don't really have an idea of what sorts of paths we're allowed to pre-color though. So in both of Thomson's theorems, it was enough to give a bound on the length of the path, but for us, that's no longer going to be true. It's not enough to consider the length. We're also going to have to characterize precisely how many vertices of each different girth type we're allowed to pre-color. In addition to that, the order of these vertices might matter. So if you have, you know, you can see from the counter examples, um, this kind of three extendability Thompson theorems that if you have a path of length two with vertices of girth three, then that doesn't work. But what if you had, you know, two vertices of girth three, a vertex of girth five sandwiched between them and then another vertex of girth three, maybe that would work. So these are all things we had to consider. So in order to start uh, to come up with a list of what I'm calling acceptable paths um, for free coloring, we had to kind of examine the what I'm calling the pure cases uh, more closely. So again, from Thomson's paper, we know that if uh, your graph only has growth three vertices and you can pre-color two adjacent vertices like that, and that's always fine. But as soon as you pre-color three, a path of length two like this, the so three vertices, uh, you start running into counter examples. So this is always fine, this is bad. I've written it's bad-ish because thanks to a different paper of Thomason's, we actually have a very, very clear understanding of precisely when this fails. Um, so I'll say that there in the next slide. And then in the pure girth four case, well then again, we investigate, find out exactly how long a path we're allowed to pre-color before we start running into uh, places where it breaks, where the coloring doesn't extend. So a path with four vertices was always fine, but as soon as you have five, it starts falling apart. And then similarly for the girth five vertices, if you have three vertices, you can always extend that coloring. But as soon as you have four vertices like this, you start running into, uh, yeah, spots where the coloring won't extend. And again, this case is bad-ish because due to Thomson's papers, we have a very good understanding of precisely when this fails. Okay, so I'll tell you now what Thomson's theorem was that characterizes these graphs for which, uh, the girth three graphs for which the path of length two um, the coloring of the path of length two doesn't extend to the whole graph. So the theorem is as follows, it's from 2007. I'll let G be a planar triangulation with outer cycle C, V1 up to VK. For each vertex V in the graph, we'll let L of V be a list of colors. We'll assume that this path of length two on the outer cycle is pre-colored. So VK, V1, V2 is pre-colored. Um, everything else on the outer cycle has a list of size at least three. And finally, everything not on the outer cycle has a list of size at least five. 
then the theorem is G has an L coloring unless G contains some subgraph G prime, which is something called a generalized wheel, whose principal path is this pre-colored path, VKV1, V2, and all of the vertices in the outer cycle of G prime are also on the outer cycle of G and have precisely three available colors. So I'll give you a formal definition of what a generalized wheel is, but I'll kind of show you some pictures and talk at you for a bit. So every wheel is a generalized wheel. Every wheel minus a circumferential edge is a generalized wheel. Uh, we say the principal path of a wheel is any path of length two on the circumference. The principal path of the structure here called a broken wheel is again a path of length two on the outer cycle like that, uh, where the endpoints of that path of length two are the vertices of degree two. And then given two generalized wheels, you can form another generalized wheel by identifying the pink vertices together and one pink edge in each graph together. And the new principal path of this generalized wheel will be the pink edges that weren't identified in these two graphs. Um, and then for our purposes, triangles are also generalized wheels. So these are the class of generalized wheels. Um, so if, you're, if your plane near triangulation doesn't contain one of these uh, with the specific list sizes and vertices in the outer cycle of your graph, then the pre-coloring of the path of length two will extend to a coloring of the whole graph. Okay, so back to our theorem. So now having established you know, what, uh, what the pure cases are like and how they work, we then had to investigate uh, how the pure cases kind of play together. So if I tell you now that your pre-colored path contains vertices of different girth, then what happens? So after playing around with this for a bit, we came up with the following list of what we're calling acceptable paths. So these are paths that you're allowed to pre-color and that the pre-coloring will hopefully extend to a coloring of the whole graph. So, uh, a path S in the outer face boundary of a plane graph is called acceptable if either it has at most three vertices or it has exactly four vertices and one of its internal vertices has girth at least five, or finally it has exactly four vertices and both internal vertices have girth at least four. So you notice here that I've drawn some explanation part, uh, points uh, next to three of these types of acceptable paths. And that's because some of the paths we came up with uh, were really useful for induction and we do, really did need to include them, but we couldn't always guarantee that the pre-coloring of the, these paths would work. So they gave rise to uh, some exceptional cases. This really complicates the analysis because whenever you're doing any sort of inductive argument, uh, coloring and deleting a subgraph of the graph and removing colors from adjacent lists, you then need to argue that you didn't create one of these exceptional cases. Okay, so before I present our technical theorem, um, I have one more definition to give. So we'll let G be a plane graph with outer phase boundary walk C. I'll say that the tuple G L S A is a canvas if S is some subgraph of C. A is an independent set of vertices in the outer cycle that all have girth five, at least five rather. Uh, and S has an L coloring, where L is a list assignment where everything in S has a list of size at least one. So again, we'll think of S as being the, the pre-colored path. Everything in A has a list of size two. Everything else has a list of size at least three. If you're not in the outer cycle and you have girth four, I'll give you four colors in your list. And finally, if you're not in the outer cycle and you have girth three, I'll give you five colors. So not in, if you look at everything that's not on the outer cycle, this is a local growth list assignment. And the outer cycle itself is just a restriction of the local growth list assignment. The claim then is if G is a planar graph and S is either an acceptable path or acceptable cycle, then if G LSA is a canvas, every coloring, uh, every L coloring rather of S extends to an L coloring of G unless G LSA is an exceptional canvas of type one, two, or three. So again, I won't give a formal definition of what it means to be an exceptional canvas, but I'll kind of hand wave it at you. Um, so exceptional canvases of type one were precisely those that came up in our version of Thomason's uh, theorem for three choosability of planar graphs of growth at least five. So you've got a pre-colored path with four vertices here and some vertex in A, so with a list of size two, that's adjacent to two things that are pre-colored. So it's really easy to see that that coloring is not going to extend to a coloring of the whole graph. Skipping the type two graphs here, we'll then go to type three. So type three are the exceptional canvases that came up in uh, that theorem of Thomason's that characterized exactly when this coloring of a path of length two didn't extend to a coloring of a near triangulation. 
So these are the subgraphs where the pre-colored path here is the principal path of a generalized wheel W. So W here indicates the presence of a generalized wheel. Here's an example of one, but of course, this holds for uh, any generalized wheel. And finally, the exceptional canvases of type two are kind of a hybrid of the two types. So living in here, we've got some generalized wheel W. And the idea with the generalized wheel is the pre-coloring of these two vertices might end up forcing a third color here. And then if you look at what's left over, we've got something really similar, well, identical to an exceptional canvas of type one. So there's a vertex here in A, so with a list of size two that's adjacent to one pre-colored thing and one essentially pre-colored thing because its color gets forced. So these are our three types of exceptional canvases. So in our language of canvases, uh, Thomason's theorems concerning the, the pure cases uh, can be stated like this. So if GLSA is a canvas where G is near triangulation, S is a path of length two in the outer phase boundary of G, then G admits an L coloring unless the canvas is an exceptional canvas of type three. Um, so here you'll note that if G is a near triangulation, every vertex has girth three. And so the special set A here, uh, vertices of girth at least five and list size two is empty. Uh, his other theorem says if GLSA is a canvas where S is an acceptable path and every vertex in G is girth at least five, then every L coloring of S extends to an L coloring of G, unless K is an exceptional canvas of type one again. So this was the one where we've got this vertex in A adjacent to two pre-colored things. So these are now special cases of our uh, more technical theorem. So again, our theorem that this coloring extends unless you have an exceptional canvas of type one, two, or three uh, directly implies our main theorem about this local girth traceability of planar graphs. And to see that, it suffices to note that in all of the exceptional cases, the pre-colored path has at least three vertices. So as long as you only pre-color two vertices, then the coloring will always go through. Alternatively, I guess you can set your pre-colored path equal to A equal to the empty set, and then it works. Okay, so for the rest of my talk, I'm gonna talk a bit about, uh, I guess our proof. Um, I hesitate even to call it a proof outline, uh, but I'll, I'll at least talk about some highlights of the proof. Um, so I'll give maybe an outline of an outline first. Um, so the way we prove it is we'll take a minimum counterexample. So that's a counterexample minimum in terms of the size of the vertex set and subject that uh, with respect to the sum of the list sizes. So what we're going to do is we're going to look uh, kind of similar to Thomason's theorems. Uh, we're going to look just off the pre-colored path S here to what happens next on the cycle. And we're going to color and delete some path P. Now, where our proof really differs from uh, any of Thomson's proofs is this path P here can get arbitrarily long. And I'll talk about that a little bit more in a second. So the idea is, again, we'll color and delete this path P, removing the colors from adjacent lists um, to get a smaller graph here. And then we'll argue that what's left over, so this G prime, L prime, S A prime, is an unexceptional canvas and thus admits an L coloring or an L prime coloring now, I guess, uh, by induction. So I'm hiding a lot there when I say uh, we'll argue that it's an unexceptional canvas. Of course, there's all kinds of things that can go wrong there. Um, and I guess the things that can go wrong fall into one of two categories. Uh, either the remainder is not a canvas or it is a canvas, but it is exceptional. So we'll kind of need to examine all of the ways in which this could break. So one of the main ways in which it could break is if it's not, if the remainder is not a canvas. So in particular, what if we delete too many colors from the list of a vertex in the outer cycle? What if we delete too many colors from the list of a vertex not in the outer cycle? Um, so what would that mean? Well, that would mean either we have a vertex with the uh, girth at least four that's adjacent to two things in P and loses two colors from its list when we delete P. Or we could have a vertex, again, not in the outer cycle, uh, with girth three, so a list of size five initially, um, that's adjacent to three things in the path P and so could lose up to three colors when passing from G to G prime here after we delete P. So all of these things would be bad and would result in this G prime, L prime, S A prime not being a canvas. Uh, another thing that could go wrong is if this new set A prime, which I'll define as the, the set of vertices of girth at least five and lists of size two after we color and delete P, um, is no longer an independent set. So remember, we, we always want A or A prime now uh, to be independent. So if it's not independent, then the resulting thing would not be a canvas. 
And finally, what if we create an exceptional canvas? So we'll dive into some of these questions in a bit more detail. Um, so first we'll look at what happens if we delete too many colors from the list of the vertex in C. So there are kind of two ways in which that can happen. Um, yeah, either something way over here, it could lose a color from its list. So something over here could be adjacent to P or this vertex here, W, uh, just after P could lose colors. So to take care of all of these guys, we'll want to show that the outer cycle C is cordless. Um, but to take care of W, uh, it's a little bit different. So the idea here is we're going to want to color U using a color that's not in the list of W. So that when we color, delete P, removing colors of lists where appropriate, W doesn't lose anything from its list. And it's actually precisely the second point that motivates our, our precise definition of P in the first place. So um, in the five choosability theorem of Thomason's, you'll remember we just kind of looked uh, at one vertex just off the pre-colored path and colored and deleted that, or deleted that, removed colors, and then added it back in. Um, for our purposes, we can't really do that. So say, for instance, uh, since we're coloring and deleting the path, say, for instance, that we want to color this first vertex and delete it and argue that what remains is an unexceptional canvas. In order to not have this next vertex, x2, lose too many colors, or lose any colors, in fact, what we want to do is color x1, something not in the list of x2. But um, it could be the case if the first vertex here only has two colors in its list, so not not quite what I've drawn here, um, that the only color available uh, here, or I guess, sorry, I, I misspoke here. It could be the case that the color that's in the list of X1 that's not in the list of X2, if this color exists at all, could be the color of this last vertex here, in which case we couldn't use it to color this vertex at all. So we can't really just delete a single vertex. And then you might look at what starts to happen if we try to delete just two vertices and kind of the same problem starts to happen. You know, the color that's uh, the color that's available for this guy over here, uh, which is to say the color in this guy's list, but not in this guy's list, could be the only available color for the vertex before it, if that vertex happens to be an A. So how we actually define our uh, our path P here, which again, we'll call a deletable path, uh, is gonna depend both on the, the list assignments of all of the other vertices in the outer cycle, and also on whether or not this vertex here, the first vertex is an A. So I, um, yeah, kind of lied to you a bit in the previous slide by saying the path P starts just after the pre-colored path. Um, yeah, maybe I'll convince you that morally it, it isn't a lie. So we've got kind of two different cases. Uh, either this first vertex here is not an A, in which case the path P does start right after S, or the vertex here is an A, in which case it has precisely two colors in its list, and it's next to something that's pre-colored. Um, and you can show that their lists do intersect. So for all intents and purposes, this has one color in its list. So we can kind of think of this color, uh, this vertex rather, in this case, as being pre-colored as well. So sort of, our path P will always start after, uh, after the path of pre-colored vertices. And then it'll stop, um, it'll need to go on for at least a couple of vertices for the reasons I mentioned earlier, and then we'll stop it as soon as we can, which is to say, as soon as we find some vertex uh, down here whose list isn't a subset of the next vertex here. So in particular, we can color this vertex without making the next vertex lose a color in its list. So that's the idea. So as you can see, based on this kind of half definition that I've given, uh, the length of P can get you know, arbitrarily long. And in particular, it might go all the way around the cycle. Okay, so I'm gonna talk about a couple of the different classes of lemmas that we have uh, that help answer or help tackle the problems that I raised on uh, a slide a few slides ago. So the first class of lemmas I'm going to talk about is uh, what I'm calling the class of separating path lemmas, which come in two flavors. So the first flavor um, rules out the existence of certain, again, what I'm calling separating paths. So a separating path is going to be a path where the vertices of the path are in C, the outer cycle, but the edges are not. Uh, or rather the endpoints of the path are in the outer cycle, but the edges in the path are not. So you might have like a chord like this or something like this, where again, the endpoints of the path are in the outer cycle, but everything else is not in the outer cycle. So some examples of our first flavor of separating path lemmas um, are separating path lemmas that are just, uh, that just serve to show that G does not contain these separating paths. 
So for instance, we have a lemma that shows that C doesn't have any chords. So G doesn't contain any separating paths of this variety. And another one that says that G doesn't contain this sort of separating path. So this is a path of length two, where one of the vertices uh, in the separating path has girth at least four. So showing that C is cordless like this uh, helps answer or helps tackle the problem of vertices in the outer cycle losing too many colors in their list when we color and delete the deletable path P. And then this kind of separating path lemma, or this separating path lemma, guarantees that no vertex in the interior of C, so here for instance, uh, with girth at least four, loses too many colors in its list. Right, because if a vertex of girth at least four uh, is adjacent to two things in P, and so loses two colors in this list, then it creates this kind of forbidden separating path, this is the idea. So that's kind of how we tackle these two questions. Uh, this with the cordless and the definition of deletable path, and then this one with the, that second separating path lemma. Um, next, we'll look at happens, what happens if you have a vertex uh, of girth three, not in the outer cycle, that's adjacent to three things in your deletable path P. So the way we tackle that is with uh, the second flavor of separating path lemmas, which doesn't quite rule out the existence of these other types of separating paths, uh, but does guarantee a certain amount of structure that we'll then exploit. So for instance, we have a, a separating path lemma that says that if you have a vertex here, W2, not in the outer cycle, that's adjacent to two things in the outer cycle like this, and all of them have girth three. Um, then it's also true that W2 is adjacent to everything on this path here from W1 to W3. And that lemma is really similar to uh, a lemma of Thomason's uh, in one of his, well, his paper where he characterizes the, the generalized wheels. Another type of lemma that we'll need to tackle this problem with the interior grade three vertices is a class of lemma uh, I'm calling the separating cycle lemmas. So again, these come in two flavors. The first flavor uh, rules out the existence of certain short separating cycles. So it says if T is a cycle in G of length at most four, then T doesn't have a vertex in its interior. And the proof of that is pretty straightforward. So you suppose not, so there's some cycle T, uh, for instance, a triangle in G that has vertices in its interior. Well, you'll delete the innards of T uh, and then color the rest of the graph by induction. So in particular, the vertices of T get colors. Uh, and then what you'll want to do is you'll set up a new list assignment on T and not touch the list assignment of anything inside it. We'll set it up so we've got two pre-colored vertices here and the list assignment on the third vertex uh, kind of forces its color. So then we'll color uh, T and its insides again by induction using this path S prime here is the pre-colored path. And then by construction, uh, this vertex down here will get the color orange, which is the color that we wanted to make the coloring on the outside here and the coloring on the inside agree. So that tells me you don't have any short separating cycles. The next flavor of separating cycle lemmas, again, doesn't rule out the existence of the separating cycles altogether, but at least guarantees a certain amount of structure. So we have, for instance, if P is a five cycle in G with a vertex in its interior, then all of the vertices on P have girth three. Or if H is a six cycle with a vertex in its interior, then all vertices in H have girth at most four. So how will we use this? Um, again, to tackle the problem that we have a vertex of girth three, not on the outer cycle, that's adjacent to at least three things on P. Um, so kind of by the definition of P and how we set up uh, and how most of the vertices in P have the same list assignment, um, we can kind of set it up with a bit of work to show that this vertex W needs to be adjacent to two things uh, on P at distance two that both have the same list, or at least a list that intersects a lot. So here, for instance, we'll say W2 uh, is adjacent to at least three things on P. In particular, it's adjacent to some vertex W3 and W4 here at distance two, where their lists are the same or at least very similar. So then the idea is we'll identify W3 and W4 to some new vertex Z down here, um, and we'll delete this middle vertex here. And then by induction, or by minimality rather, we can color uh, this graph here. And then the problem is just to extend that coloring back to a coloring of G. And of course, since our lists were set up just so, uh, both W3 and W4 can take on the color of Z. And then we just need to color this vertex here, which has a list of size three, with something that isn't teal or yellow. So 
that's the idea. Uh, now you might be you might be a little worried here because I've done something kind of sneaky. Um, so our whole our whole thing is that vertices list sizes depend on their local girth. And what I've done there is I've identified two non-adjacent vertices like that, which you might worry could change the girth of something in the graph. And that's a fair question, but hopefully I'll convince you that this doesn't actually happen. Um, so that was actually a legal move. So suppose, uh, I guess the problem is, what if a vertex changes girth category when we identify uh, W3 and W4? So what, what if something with girth five goes down to girth three or something with you know, girth at least five, girth six, goes down to girth four and so on and so forth. So we'll do an example of this. What if there's some vertex U here with girth five in the original graph who, when we identified W3 and W4 like this, ends up with girth three? If that were to happen, then we couldn't actually use induction to color the graph after we did this identification. But if you look at this, um, what this means is then U is part of a five cycle here um, that contains a vertex here of girth at least five, and there's this vertex here in its interior. So this was W2 in the previous picture. And that violates our separating five cycle lemma. that doesn't happen. Uh, another question to tackle, and the last one I'll get into really in detail, I guess, is what if the new set A prime, so that's vertices of girth at least five and lists of size two, isn't independent anymore? So using our separating path lemmas uh, of all flavors, we can show that this can happen in exactly one way um, up to where our path starts. So it can happen uh, in this way. So we've got a vertex U1 and a vertex U2 both of girth at least five, and so that originally had three colors in their lists that are adjacent to each other and each adjacent to a specific vertex on the path P. So obviously this would be a problem because when we color and delete P and remove colors from adjacent lists, uh, U1 and U2 would end up in the set A prime, which we need to be independent. So how do we get around that? Well, we get around that by coloring and deleting U1 and U2 as well. And then arguing that the remainder, which now we'll call G double prime, L double prime, S A double prime, is an unexceptional canvas. Well, what does that mean? Well, it'll mean that we need to go back and revisit most of these questions again. Now, I won't go into this because you know it's kind of similar arguments and stuff, but I'm just trying to give, a, give an idea of the type of problems we had to tackle. So it's no longer enough now to guarantee that vertices not on the outer cycle be just not adjacent to too many things in P. You also need to guarantee now that they're also not adjacent to things in U1, U2 as well. Um, I'll talk about one more reduction briefly. Uh, and that's the one that arises when we try to tackle this problem. So what if the new set a double prime of vertices of girth at least five and lists of size two after we delete P and U1 and U2 uh, is no longer an independent set? So for example, what if you have something like this? So here, W1 and W2 have growth at least five. W1 is adjacent to U1. W2 is adjacent to something in P. Um, when you delete all color and delete everything in pink, W1 and W2 now only have two colors in their lists and they're adjacent. So A double prime is not independent. Oops. So the idea here is to spot that this path Q here uh, separates the graph again into two graphs, G1 and G2, both of which are strictly smaller than G. Uh, and their intersection is the path Q. So what we'll want to do is ignore uh, everything in G2 for a second and color G1 by induction. And then ideally, we would now have some pre-colored path here uh, whose pre-coloring we could extend to a coloring of G2 as well. Um, the problem is that Q is not an acceptable path. So in particular, it's way too long. So how we get around this one is we say, all right, well, what we're going to do then is forget G1, now we're just looking at G2. What we'll do is we'll color and delete this path H here. Um, so then once we do that, there will just be three colored vert three pre-colored vertices, all of which have growth at least five. Um, and so we'll have to argue then that what's left over is an unexceptional canvas and thus admits coloring. Okay. So those, those are the main reductions uh, and problems I wanted to talk about. So again, to reiterate, we had this technical lemma uh, that's stronger than the thing that we actually, actually wanted to prove, uh, pretty closely following the, the general framework of how Thomas improved his theorems for five choosability and three choosability, planning graphs of growth at least five. And we showed that that implies uh, our main choosability theorem that every planar graph is local growth choosable. And again, some of the main takeaways, the ways in which our theorems were different was our pre-colored path, or rather our uh, 
a deletable path, I was calling it the path P uh, that we color and delete and then argue by induction about what remained, uh, was allowed to get arbitrarily long. That makes a proof quite different from any of uh, Thomson's proofs. And a couple of the other more uh, tricky um, inductive arguments that come up near the end, like the last one I showed, were also, um, yeah, not, not quite like anything in, uh, that I'd seen in Thomson's papers. Um, but I think the result is really interesting. Hopefully I've convinced you that it is as well. Uh, it kind of goes to show that, at least for planar coloring, um, it really is this kind of local structure that makes the coloring question hard. Um, and in particular, you know, the, the way I was kind of thinking about it is that if you have if you have just an arbitrary planar graph, so a graph with triangles, it's not coloring graphs with triangles that is a hard thing to do and that requires many color choices. It's really just coloring the triangles themselves that is the hard thing to do. Um, and similarly, it's not coloring, you know, graphs with no triangles and no four cycles, or rather no triangles and no four cycles, that's hard. It's coloring just the four cycles themselves that takes up, uh, you know, more that needs more color choices and is the trickier thing to do. Anyway, that's our theorem. Uh, thank you all for coming. I hope you enjoyed. If you have any questions, I would be delighted to answer them. Evelyn, thank you so much. That was such an interesting talk and result. It's really cool. So everyone, let's unmute and we'll give her a round of applause. Uh, so I'll count to three and then we'll clap. One, two, three. Awesome. Thanks. Okay, and uh, does anyone have any questions for Evelyn? You can uh, unmute and, and go ahead. Yeah, I was, um, <clears throat> I was wondering if you look at different things about the faces instead of just the size of the faces around each vertex. Have you thought much about, is it really the cycles or is it something to do with the way the cycles align with each other? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, yeah, I'm not sure. I know that there are, there are some results uh, I can't think of exactly what they are now, but they they characterize kind of similar things. Where if you have planar graphs with the uh, where all of you can be guaranteed that not the three cycles don't intersect in too many complicated ways, then you can lower the list sizes. Uh, well, so I know well, if you look at maybe like the average face size incident to to each vertex as opposed to, instead of the shorter cycle, the uh, the average length of each of the faces. There. Yeah, that'd be that'd be definitely interesting to think about. Um, I would imagine the average isn't great, but something might be. Yeah, or some linear combination of average and shortest cycle or something like that. Um, yeah, I'd definitely be interested in looking at more, more complicated local parameters like that, that maybe combine uh, yeah, two different local parameters to, to determine the list sizes. But I haven't looked at any of it yet, but it's definitely an interesting idea. Okay. Thanks. Anyone else uh, have any questions for Evelyn? I was maybe going to ask something about algorithms, um, and I'm not exactly sure what my question is, but um, does this imply any kind of like any algorithm results or? I think there's there's supposed to be something where this or something similar will hopefully imply some quadratic time algorithm for coloring, uh, given this local growth list assignment. Uh, I'm not 100% sure how the argument goes, but I think it is there somewhere. Well, thank you again, Evelyn. I'll stop the recording there and then we can have some informal discussion.